This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and welcome to The 1000 Authors Show. I'm Vicky Quinn, and this is my husband, Joe Fraser. Hello. Hello. Joe Fraser. Joe <laughs> Fraser. Hello. Hi. Um, what's going on with your head, Joe? We are in day 900 of lockdown and I'm needing a haircut. <laughs> you need to... Okay, so in the thumbnail, wherever you have found this podcast, I'm sure there is a thumbnail of Joe looking thoroughly shocked at his hair, which is understandable if, you, if you've seen it. If not, go and watch the YouTube version of this podcast and marvel at the... How should we describe Magnificence. it? At the luxuriant. <laughs> at the magnificence of Joe's lockdown hair. I've offered to cut it for him, but he's just like, nope, I want to see how far it'll go. I think it's going to go quite far. <laughs> it already has gone quite far. Look at it go. I know. It's amazing. Okay, so um, this week we are talking about being uniquely valuable and not unique. Okay. I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a bit. Good. But first... What are you reading, Joe? I'm reading Mythos by Stephen Fry. What do you think? Um, it's a little bit discordant. It feels like... It's like, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then he begat them. And it's like, it's like that whole chapter of the Bible where they just all begat each other and lots of things happened, Funny but that. it's not written very well. Do you think that chapter of the Bible was made maybe based on some older Greek and Roman myths? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because there's there's like floods and there's creation myths. Creation, and... yeah, the whole the whole creation myth thing is going on strong, and there's lots of lots of parallels. Mm. Um, I started reading Mythos and I, I put it down, but I might come back to it again. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I'm that bothered. Mm. I, I you know if if I tripped over the right book, I'd put it down pretty quickly. Yeah, I put the right book in front of you. Well, no, but just before you gave it to me, you said I don't know whether you're going to like this because it's a bit meh. No. And, then, and then I was like, oh, well, that sounds great. No, 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 you will like it. Okay, so the book that I'm talking about is Piranesi by Susanna Clark, which I've just finished, literally just finished. Right. And it's great. It's really good. You do have to, you do have to push through the first few pages because just to get used to... It's written as diary entries, journal entries, but it's really good. It's really thought-provoking, and I don't know, I... I really enjoyed it because it is thought provoking in terms of it's a really good study on solitude. Right. And it's a really fantastic example of world building. It's just built this beautiful visual world. Um, and it's, it's kind of a mystery story as well, all rolled up. Okay. I think it's great. I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. All right. I loved it. You seem to be picking up a lot of books with quirky writing styles at the moment. What's going on there? I don't know. I'm just like asking for recommendations and then taking them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm, because I've just finished Piranesi, I'm just starting The Truth by Terry Pratchett for, I think this is, an, I think this is only the second reading of The Truth, actually. Okay. I don't think I've read The Truth at all. Oh, it's great. It's about um, the Discworld's first newspaper and media manipulation and propaganda and all that kind of thing, which I have a big bee in my bonnet about at the moment. Okay. Um, we're not going to talk about that this week. We'll talk about it when I have coherented, coher- cohe- yeah, coherented, coherented my thoughts. Yes, it's not a word. Is it? No, no. Okay, but you know what I mean, though. Yeah. Um, and my non-fiction book that I'm reading is "The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck" by Mark Manson. Okay. Which, which is great, and I think you'll enjoy that as well. But that is this week's, uh, this month's Bookaholics Anonymous, Anonymous book. Um, it's an easy read and it's it's good. Actually, one thing I will say about it is, like, I have no problem with swearing, as you know. I mm-hmm. like to drop the odd fuck bomb. Um, but the first few pages of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck had an awful high fuck count. Right. And it irritated me a little bit because it just felt like it was... Like, I'm, you know, a bit of well-placed swearing, fine. If it's, but that's, do you remember when we stopped watching, was it The Wire? 
Because yes. I just, I just, I just found the level of swearing distracting. It was like it's, it's like it was deliberately put there to be provocative instead of just being part of the, mm-hmm. yeah. And so, and it actually, um, Mark Manson's book, it really is only the first few pages, and after that, it kind of turns kind of into normal up. writing again. So it's, it's fine. But, um, but I, yeah, that that was, I was a bit surprised about that because Mark Manson isn't really one to, I don't know, deliberately be provocative. He just does what he does, and it just felt a little bit forced. And it got in the way for me of um, the actual writing. But like I said, it was only the first few pages, so that's kind of fine. But I'm really enjoying it. Cool. Yeah. So this week at um, Casa Dingle, we currently have no hot water and are going to have no hot water until when, Joe? Hopefully Friday. Today, as we are recording this, is Monday. Hopefully Friday. Hopefully hot water on Friday. Why hopefully? Well, I mean, the house might fall down in the meantime. Who knows? So... Why have we got no hot water, Joe? Should we explain? Uh, because we are moving away from oil. Um, we are putting, As the rest of the planet should be. As the rest of the planet should be. Um, sadly, we can't go for uh, like the ground source or air source stuff. So we are going for gas. We are not on gas mains, but we've got a gas tank now. And so we're going to have a like, a like a combi boiler that just like does the job without requiring people to like trim the wicks and turn it on and off with matches and stuff. You know, uh, right? It's going to be amazing. We're going to have um, hot water and a working radiator. A working radiator. <laughs> One single working radiator. It's really exciting. <laughs> We're going to gradually add more radiators around the house. And the reason for this having a single radiator is twofold. Reason the first, we've got a lot of building work and rearrangement work and it just doesn't make sense to put them all in at the moment because mm-hmm. we don't really know where they're going to be. And reason the second is that the radiators that I want are ludicrously expensive, so we can't afford to put them in other than one by one. And reason the third as to why we have a radiator at all is because you need one, otherwise your combi boiler explodes. Yeah. It needs to have somewhere to dump the heat. Yeah. So it's going to dump all of the heat into the Rayburn room, which is going to help my seeds to grow. Yes. My seeds are already growing. I've got tomato seeds coming up. I know. That's all. And alpine strawberries. It's very exciting. Very exciting. It's very exciting. But yes, at the moment, there's a couple of plumbers walking around and pulling bits of pipe out of the house and generally smashing things around and climbing around in attics whilst looking dubiously at the thing they're crawling around on, going, uh, do you think this will hold? I'm like, I don't know. Make your own risk assessment. You have insurance and risk assessment forms, presumably. That is up to you. <laughs> I am not recommending anything. Yeah. Yeah, did they actually ask if it is it safe to walk around on? They were like, have you been around? Have you been, have you been on top of this? And I was like, nope. <laughs> we, we've kind of stuck our torsos through and like, you know, laying around on it and haven't fallen through, but that's just us. Yeah, I mean, it's it, uh, the timber work in this house, ceilings and floors held up by spider webs and hope. Definitely a lot of hope. And quite a lot of, um, there's a lot of woodworm tunnels. Hmm. Quite, okay. quite a lot of the timber is, is just kind of what's left behind after the woodworm have eaten everything they want. Woodworm poo. Hmm. Anyway. Shall we crack on with the Probably should. People aren't here to talk about, well, to hear about the dingle, really, are they? No. Well, mostly we did books. Mm, That's fine. Um, So, be uniquely valuable, Joe, not unique. Okay. End of story. That's the podcast. Yeah. So, do you want to know what that means? Uh, Okay. So, the reason I got thinking about this is because people will give me a lot of different reasons as to why they haven't yet written their book or as to why they, quote marks, can't write their book. Yes. Um, and they all pretty much boil down to one thing. Um, and that one thing is to do with just confidence and the, you know, the voices inside your head and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways in which that manifests itself is that we have this idea that our books need to be unique, like truly unique. And that idea holds us back from writing our books. Mm -hmm. It held me back from writing my first book because I was like a copywriter and marketer at the time. And I remember people saying, oh, write a book. And I was like, the world does not need another book on marketing. Yeah, there's loads of them. Yeah, which it absolutely didn't. You know, there are more than enough books on marketing out there. A lot of them are really shit and boring. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really great ones as well. And so I was just like, ugh, you know, why would I do that? Um, And then I pulled my head out my butt and realized that I didn't have to write just another book on marketing. It wasn't meant to be a textbook. Um, It was meant to be my experience of things. And actually, I think the book that I wrote was really useful because I wrote it as somebody who was really new to business and marketing. And it was 
just from the point of view, from my point of view. And which book was this? This was Business for Superheroes, mm -hmm. available on Amazon nice. and at some good bookshops <laughs> <laughs> and my website. Cool. Um, but yeah, and so that was that was my take on things, and I didn't did not then and do not now pretend that that was you know even necessarily a great book on marketing, but it was my take on what it was like to start and market my business as a newbie. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, it was really useful for people. A lot of people liked it, didn't they? Yeah, and a lot of people like my favorite story from this is um, Cyan. Hi, Cyan. Hi, Cyan. Um, and she got in touch with me and told me all about how. Um, that book had like literally changed her life because she got in touch with me um, a few years ago. And she's, bless her, she's got the date that my book arrived. Oh, wow. Uh, she has the date that my book arrived up on a, a little sign in her office, which just like made me cry buckets when she told me this. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I remember her writing to me and saying and telling me just that she she was running her business and, you know, she didn't have any money and couldn't afford to buy the book. And I was like, give me your address and I'll send you the book. And I sent her the book. And a little later, I got another message from her saying, we're going to have the best Christmas in years because I've read your book and I'm doing the work. And a little bit after that, she was like, I want to join your group because I can now afford it. And it was just the most incredible, it was, you know, and nothing that I wrote in that book was new mm -hmm. or even particularly clever or anything like that. It's just that... Um, your experience and... and yeah, and it arrived in her life at the right time for her. And so, I mean, I could sum up, uh, this This podcast could be summed up with that little story. It's mm. like, be uniquely valuable, not unique. That is the perfect example of being uniquely valuable to somebody. Because, yeah. you know, it, there are people out there who can't wait no more, no way more than me about marketing and copywriting and all the rest of it. That's not the point. I never claimed to know everything or even be the best or, you know. Yeah. You just claim to be you. Mm, yeah, exactly. And here is my story. Yeah, and so I'm really glad I wrote that book. And then it happened again, the whole, you know, oh, I need to be unique. It happened again when I wrote my second book as well. How the hell do you write a book? Because I had the same thought, you know, there are, it's not a unique idea. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of people who've written books about how to write a book, um, how to write a business book, all the rest of it. Um, why do I need to write a book about it? And that stopped me for ages from actually sitting down and doing the work. And it's, it was time wasted because... Actually, nobody has written quite the same book as me, not with the same approach that I've taken. Um, so yeah, I just, this fear is not unique, basically. I've got dozens of messages from would-be authors telling me that it's one of the things that's holding them back. You know, my, my idea is not unique. I haven't got anything new or interesting to say. Sure. And it's simply not true. The new and interesting thing that each person has is their own experience. Yeah, and not even that, though. There's, there's other stuff that they have as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, I don't know, there's quite a lot to kind of dig into when we start looking at this problem. And I think it starts with our Western idea of, like, extreme individualism. Right. Um, where we prioritise, and this is particularly a problem in America, I think, because of their, you know, their pursuit of the American dream and that we can achieve. And there's good stuff about that, um, to a lesser extent in the UK. Um, but we have this idea that we prioritise you know, our sense of individualism over all else. And I think that that idea has, is really problematic mm -hmm. because it takes the, I don't know, it like minimizes the value of the collective, of society, of putting the needs of the group first. Because if, you, if everybody always goes around prioritizing themselves over everybody else, that society will collapse, right? Right. It will. Um, and so we're, we're kind of sold this idea that the most important thing in the world is to be this unique Snowflake. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And that's not to say that we, we need to blend in and like become factory automatons because that's just <laughs> that I can see that argument now. I can see I can see people giving me that argument now. Oh, you just want us to be all fa factory automatons? No, there's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yes. There's somewhere in the middle that we can be um, that involves us working for the collective good of everybody, whilst also being true to who you are and and. You know, being as interesting as you are. Yeah. And I don't know how, you know, what the best way to do that is or how to go about that necessarily. I think it's quite difficult because, like I said, we're not taught how to do this stuff. We're, it, it's weird. It's, it's like we're taught this 
from school, from what I remember school, it's like this weird duality of you must fit in and you must do as you're told and blah, blah, blah. But also you must stand out. <laughs> and <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's, but not like that. But, yeah, <laughs> but not like that. Oh, and I tell you what, that's, yeah, it's like, and you know what? The Black Lives Matter protests are a perfect example of this. It's mm. like, do you remember when Colin Kaepernick took my knee? Yes. And everyone was like, that's really disrespectful. That's Don't outrageous. protest like that. And so they took to the streets. It's like, <laughs> not like that. And, you know, it's okay for that dickhead in the UK who drove up to Barnard's castle because it was for the best for his family. He was trying to do the best for his family. But when you've got refugees bringing their kids over here, yeah. not like that. Sure. <laughs> so, and that is thoroughly relevant to what we're talking about right now with the being uniquely valuable and not unique. It's like, there are many ways to, there are many ways to add value and there are many ways to do things. And as soon as somebody says not like that, for me, that's a really good sign that you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. Because it means that you are upsetting the status quo or you are challenging some, you know, some old school's deeply held beliefs or, you know, you're pushing back against the patriarchy and white supremacy, which we should all be doing more of. And so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot to think about when we're like, okay, so how do we do this? How do we be uniquely valuable and not just unique? And I think we start off by looking at why we do things the way we do and how we organize society and how we pursue our goals without being selfish about it or without subsuming our personality to, to become the same as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's any easy way to do it. I don't think there's any easy answer. No straightforward answer. Mm. But I think I think the message really is, you know, you, you don't you don't have to be to write your book. You do not have to be the world's best, most expensive, most experienced mechanic or plumber or copywriter or whatever it is that you know, dog trainer or whatever it is that you do. You don't have to be that. No, you can just be you. Yeah, and you can. You don't even. I say you don't even have to do it. You don't have to do it on your own. There's, like I talk about this in my book, there's the bullshit of rugged individualism. This idea that we have to do everything on our own. And it's like a lot of your, what makes you unique will come from your interactions with other people and what you learn from them and mm. what you create with them as well. Like loads of the stuff that I have put out there and created has come because I've talked to other people or worked with other people or like Dom. Hi, Dom. Hi, Dom. Um, he always invites me to speak at his events. And from those events and from working with Dom, I've come up with some really cool stuff to offer in my own business that would not have, it would not have Never existed. Have occurred. Yeah. It wouldn't have occurred to me without it. And it's the same with my other business partners as well. Um, so I think it's really, really important to remember that they're just the idea that each person is an Island just simply is not true and it's damaging. And I think it's dangerous to, I just think it's a dangerous idea. It's like, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, leading on from all of that is this, Further idea that we all have to be special snowflakes and above average and exceptional. And by definition, most of us can't be above average, you know? <laughs> and if we were all exceptional, whatever that means, then none of us would be. Yes. And I think we forget the power of normal. And so I'm not talking... And again, I can, I can see objections coming from people. It's like, oh, I don't, don't just want to run an average business. That's not what I'm talking about. We can raise the bar from mediocrity to excellent without eroding our sense of community and without striving for this unrealistic, you know, special snowflake status. It's like, actually, we're really, all of us are really, really similar. And when you start digging into the problems that you have and the challenges that you face, and when you start talking about them and researching them, you realize that actually everybody has the same challenges and problems. Mm -hmm. And like that, they're, they're, you know, slightly different circumstances and all the rest of it. But like, I'm not the only person who sits here and goes, God, I'm really shit. It's like everybody has days like that sometimes. Sure. Um, and so, and it's really helpful to realize that. It's like, because otherwise we, there's a danger that we're like, oh, maybe I am special. Maybe there is something really wrong with me. And it's like, no, no, that's just how human brains work. Hmm. It's just, it's just how it is. So, yeah. But I think that idea that we have to all be exceptional, again, will hold us back from writing our books. Because it's like, if we've set ourselves this impossibly high bar to reach that I have yeah. to write a New York Times bestseller. I'll, I'll write a book when I when my company is in the top 100. Yeah. And it's, you know, that might not ever happen and it shouldn't stop you from writing your book. And, you know, who's not to say that your book might not help you get to the top 100. Hmm. So yeah, there's, there's all of, all of that stuff. I, I like the idea instead of concentrating on excellence and I'm going to use the example of tradespeople here <laughs> <laughs> because 
Honestly, if there are any tradespeople listening, it's so easy for you to stand out from everybody else just by being above average. And when I say like above average, I mean reply to people's messages. <laughs> Let them know when you're going to start work. Communicate with them and tidy up after yourself. And, you know, just little things. And it's like nothing that will cost you money or even much effort. But that, and, it, you know, even saying that sounds ludicrous. It's like, what you mean? actually communicating with people will make me stand out above everybody else. Yeah, it will. Because there seems to be this idea in the trades that that's just the way things are done. Therefore, you, you just might not turn up that day. Yeah. Or you might start late or leave early or spend half the day disappearing in your van somewhere. Yeah. And you might be in the trades and listening to this and thinking, well, I don't do any of that stuff. And I'm like, great, you're awesome. You probably are doing super well. And if you're not, then you need to put your prices up because mm. I personally will pay a premium for tradesmen who just do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. Yeah. And don't leave a mess. And yeah, that, that's literally all you have to do. And it's, it's, I'm kind of picking on the trades because it's an easy one to pick on. But there are other industries as well where the bar is so low. Like the bar of service is so low. that do you remember when we had our solicitor for the house and he got it done within like yeah. 30 days? Um, and all he did was do his job. Yes. And But for us, that was like, oh my God, you're amazing. And that just shows how low the bar for... Um, we, yeah, we're expecting delays. We're expecting things to get missed. We're expecting... We're expecting them not to answer their emails or to lose stuff or to just not communicate with the other solicitors. The deadlines to go sailing by. Yeah. And so for him to just do all the things that he was supposed to do when he did it, when he said he would do it, for us was like, wow. And it's like, it shouldn't be that way, That's but it is. Yeah. And so... So yeah, even just by talking about that kind of thing, you know, maybe write a book about that. If you want to be a disruptor in your industry and particularly in something like financial services or um, the legal profession where the bar really is low because traditionally as well, that was, um, you know, it's a very, it's a very kind of snooty business where we're like, oh, I've had all of this education and, you know, we're, we're not to be argued with. But it's like, it's difficult to argue with solicitors mm. and financial experts because they do have this knowledge that we don't. And so, you know, if you want to be a disruptor in your industry, write a book about how that is bullshit and you want to change it. And you will absolutely 100% upset 90% of your peers in that industry. But fuck them because they're not the ones who are paying you. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's one idea for you. Anyway, back to, um, back to unique. So when we talk about the idea of a unique idea, I mean in the sense of inventing something com completely new. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people are thinking, you know, I need my book to be about a completely new idea. And most of us just aren't going to do that. And that stops us from writing our books. And it's a lot of pressure as well, right? Yeah, for sure. And and not within the not within the scope of what most people can do. No, it's not. Um, and, you know, this, this idea that we can only write a book if it contains brand new, never before seen or heard ideas and that come out of our heads fully formed with no input from anywhere else is just nonsense. So you don't have to have a unique idea to be unique, you just have to be uniquely valuable. And I think it's really important to remember that. So I have three ideas to help you write a book that's gonna stand out. Um, stand out idea number one. Uh, perhaps you've hit on a new twist of an old idea, uh, like your creative book coaching program. Yeah. Oh, I got my turn. Yeah. Okay. So there's loads of great book coaches out there all doing their own thing. Um, but my thing is different. My, my approach is slightly different. Um, for me, it's not only about writing the book. That's obviously the goal of the coaching program. But I also want to create a writer, somebody who can do that all over again on their own if they want to. Mm -hmm. And I also, there's a lot of mindset stuff and there's a couple of other bits and pieces. So if you do your thing differently from other people in your industry, then that's your unique value. Cool. That's something that's different. Standout idea number two. Uh, do you have a different way to tell your story? Uh... Yeah. So two of my favourite examples, Emma DeBerry and her brilliant book, Don't Touch My Hair, mm -hmm. which you've read, haven't you? I have. Excellent. Really good, in which she writes all about colonialism and racism and her story growing up as a black girl in Ireland in a time where there were hardly any black people there, which is, you know, a story that has been told many times by different people mm -hmm. in different ways. But she takes, and they're all important, by the way, all of those different stories are important, but she puts a different take on it. She tells the story through the lens of black hair and the history of black hair. And it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's incredible. It's a totally different way of looking at um, and getting people to look at a really, really important issue. 
mm-hmm. that, that people don't want to think about and want to sweep under the carpet because it's really uncomfortable to realise that actually we're all benefiting from a horrible racist society. It's like, well, let's look at it from a different point of view and get people actually thinking about it. So it's a, it's a wonderful book. I love it. Um, and Carol Clark. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Um, and her most recent book, The Doggy Doctor Surgery Secrets, is all about dog behavioural training, but through the lens of her previous life as a medical doctor. Okay. Which is really cool because dog behaviour and medical diagnosis are, have a lot of crossovers. So that's how she's written her book. Doctors as dogs. Doctors as dogs. No? <laughs> Do- doctor dogs. Dogs that are doctors. Oh, I've got a little image now of a dog with a white coat and a stethoscope. Mm. That's cute. Carol, you should totally dress up one of your dogs in doctor outfits, <laughs> even though I don't like animals being dressed up. Makes me feel sad. <laughs> anyway, standout idea number three. Uh, embrace your personality and experience and spread it liberally throughout your book. Yeah, and that's the most simple way of all to do it. Yeah. Just, like, allow yourself to be 100%, well, maybe 80% you. Expose yourself to the reader. Centre page. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I mean, well, I don't know. It depends what kind of book you're writing, I suppose. <laughs> um, anyway. But it's, yes, yeah, your thoughts, your personality. Allow allow your story to come through the book. Yeah. And by the way, one of the reasons, one of the massive benefits of working with a book coach, um, whether it's me or somebody else, is that they will be able to help you decide what's appropriate because that is a legit worry that people have is like well how much information is too much information and Mm -hmm. i don't want um, my dirty laundry and all the rest of it and a good book coach will help you to figure that out they will help you to you know create craft your messaging so that it doesn't you know because quite often i like first drafts that i see and we'll do a whole episode on this at some point are either really flat and dry Mm -hmm. or they're superly over overly emotional and ranty right They're, they're kind of one or the other um and so a good book coach will help you to moisten the dry one (laughs) Um, by putting appropriate levels of feeling into it and they will help you to um just calm the overly emotional ranty you know bits that you're you're like "Mm, maybe there's a better way to say this and maybe that's not quite how you want to come across so yeah if you're worried about the whole putting your personality into a book and overdoing it then at the very least get beta readers who are not necessarily your best friends yeah. um, to, to have a read. But that's where a book coach will be really, really valuable to you is helping to get that message right. So, so yeah, there are really very few truly unique ideas out there in the world. And even those that are, they stand on the shoulders of previous ideas. So let yourself off the hook. Take the pressure off. What's the takeaway, Joe? Stop trying to be unique. Um, start being uniquely valuable. Yes. It starts with you and the writer. <laughs> Were you trying to read that without looking at what you were reading? Well, I was trying to read that without actually, like, reading it. I was trying to, was trying to paraphrase it. It's true, though. The takeaway is just stop trying to be unique and start being uniquely valuable. And there is, I hope you now realise, a difference. <laughs> um, once again, I have not prepared um, the book that I wanted to share because it's up on the shelf, so I'm going to do that next week, and I'm just going to pick up the one that is down here, underneath my new Remarkable tablet. Finally showed up. Yay! Um, and it's Word Glue by Louise Karsh. Hi, Louise. <laughs> I would love it if she was actually listening to this. Um, so Louise Karsh works for Seth Godin, and um, she's got this book, and it's 88 Australian dollars, which is much less in pounds, because their exchange rate is bulls. Good for us, not so for, not so for them. Um, and it is a... Right, you open the book. Well, it's Word Glue, find your million dollar brand name. You open it up and it says, Hi, your brand name has two seconds to stick. Time's up, let's go. Which is a really great first um, thing. And it's a load of exercises about how to come up with brand names, names for your business, names for your products, names for your services. Cool. I'm currently working through it because I'm terrible at naming my shit. And I want to come up with some good names for my creative book coaching program and some of my other services too cool so if anyone has by the way if anyone has any amazing ideas as to what to call my book coaching program or my one-off idea ideation sessions answers on a postcard to the usual address and there will be if i pick one of them there will absolutely be prizes in it for you so yeah Uh, coming up next week uh, we're going to be talking about how to write the right book for you Mm -hmm. um and i have 
Speaking of book coaching, three spots open for my six month creative book coaching program at the moment. If you want to join me, um, you can apply at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash creative hyphen book hyphen coaching. Link is in the show notes. <laughs> Continuing my tradition of ridiculous URLs. Terrible URLs. Um, but yes, uh, three spots on my creative book coaching course. Cool. Six months blank page to published. Oof. Yeah. Getting it done. Getting it done. So if you're interested in that, moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash creative hyphen book hyphen coaching or drop me an email vicky at vickyfraser.com um, and I will send you a link to the application form. Um, I also have uh, my audiobook is nice. out. Yeah, you can find it on Audible. It's called That's What She Said. It now has 29 ratings and a bunch of nice um, comments. Cool. The person who left me two stars still hasn't left me a review, so I don't know. I'm assuming that they hit the two star button by accident. <laughs> Um, and if you've listened to every episode of this email me with your postal address I will send you a special silly gift nice if you'd like this podcast go to iTunes and subscribe it can help us climb the rankings or go to Stitcher or wherever you subscribe leave us a review five stars Uh, it'll help people find us and hopefully laugh and learn something yeah and if you know somebody who will enjoy this nonsense send them to moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast nice thanks Joe no worries Thanks for listening, listeners. It's lovely to share this uh, time with you, as always. Uh, now go and write your book. We'll be back same time next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Mm-hmm.